back. Welcome to the IFA 2022. After four years, the IFA has already started today and we will figure out what the industry is talking about. Just follow us, let's go. Hey, wait, that's the first booth. So if you're looking for the most important topic of IFAT, maybe we'll find it here. Do you know that we have 639 companies just for the water space? Out of the 639, there are 60% which are saying water reuse is one of our major topics. You're right, water reuse seems to be in the spot. There's a conference on exactly that right now. So I'll have a look and I'll tell you what they said. out that everything is doable and possible, yet that leaves me with one simple question. If water reuse is doable and possible, why don't we simply reuse water? the water chain because uh, there's one water and we have a mission, mission water, and we want to reuse and recover and reduce the water. So if it's a factory or if it's a household or it's a high-rise building, yeah. we want to uh, redesign the system to reuse all the water what is possible but because that's really urgent. So apparently it's urgent and we have to change, but first things first, do we have the technologies ready to reuse water? The technologies are existing. People do it, but it's more easy to have portable water taken out from the ground. I think there is all technology available. We could do it. We can do water reuse from wastewater to tap. It's possible. It's more a psychological thing. It's not the technology that is missing. The technology is there, but it's about uh, mainly about the regulations. So this is the main problem. All the technology is there. You can treat wastewater to look at drinking water quality or even better quality than tap water. I think we have the technology available. It's more the discussion on, on regulations, on governance, how to decide what regulation is okay, discuss how to reach the requirements on water quality. But the technology we have, that's not the problem. Technically, everything is possible, but we have to discuss the value because we have to go to true cost pricing and we have to go to the business models around water. We have to find ways to make value out of water or recovery from products out of water. So is that true? Do we really have all the technology available that would be needed to reuse wastewater?
use, water recycling and so on and so on. We have major, major parts. So we have the one part, which is the agriculture sector. And the other part is a little bit the, um, the industrial sector. So these both are the major drivers for water and wastewater reuse. So that means you have to deliver the kind of technologies to deliver to these both industries, right? Okay, we had a little technical issue, so I, I listened to you from one ear, but it also pushed me to, 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 to crack a secret, and actually, you have a voice in that game today, and that voice is right in front of you. What is going to be the voice of the public, the voice of the chat? So if you have questions, if you have anything you'd like to raise, just use the chat, what is going to be there, and now we have one additional thing. is You know Walid, Walid Khoury is the guy which raises the best questions in the water industry, so the water questions, so he has also a couple of joker cards you can raise to our guests we will have later on in the show. So, that being said, yeah, I'll bring it back on track. And, and yeah, actually, we, we saw that people were quite reluctant to, to discuss yeah. about the stuff. Not, of not all of them, to be, to be very fair, but we found some which claimed and said, well, there's nothing really special we have to say about water recycling. So they refused a little bit to talk to us. But all the others, I mean, what was the major statement? All technologies are available. Is that true? Absolutely. So if the technologies are available, what prevents us from using them? Well, actually, there's one thing which also came out from those discussions. It's that we have to distinguish reuse and reuse. Actually, when you say reuse, what do you, th what do you see? It's probably that thing of you drinking water that your neighbor has peed, right? No, I don't do that. Yeah, I, I know you don't do that, but that's the image that, sure. that the people have. And actually, the problem with that is that we are limiting ourselves to a very, very tiny portion of what this full water cycle is. Because what's the water we drink? It's 1% of 10%. So it's 0.1% of the water. And let's not start by there. Why would we start by reusing that portion of the cycle instead of which we could be re reusing the other 99.9%? .9 which is? Agriculture yes. for 70%. And the other which one? Is industry for 20%. Exactly. And the rest of the grey water. And, and that is actually the name of the game in those technologies, right? Exactly. As I said, all of them said for, for these kind of applications, all technologies are available. So the other question we had and we asked a little bit the uh, companies we talked to is, okay, what are, you know, what are a little bit the drivers for your clients? You, you, you're jumping a bit too fast yes. to the drivers. Why? Because actually, we discuss technologies. And the technologies are very different if you want to, to reuse your water at home from if you want to reuse it to agriculture. But if you look at the way we were looking yeah. thousands of years ago to reuse water, we call that just irrigation of the crops. And that was pretty cool because people which were peeing and pooing in the water, that made quite a good fertilizer. Just to say, we have to capture the right technology to the right use, which is water fit for purpose at the end of the day. Okay, agree. So, but anyways, what are the drivers? Okay, so you want to jump <laughs> to the drivers. Okay, that guy has a train to take, I think. Let's go to the drivers. Yeah, we have nothing, a little bit more to say, right? We have some, it's a special show and there was much more to come. So we are a little bit in pressure. So come on. Have a, let's, let, let's see at what you said and what you told us when we were visiting IFAT this year. The drivers, what a scarcity seemed to be the elephant in the room. The demand for recycled water is growing and growing and growing because we have a lack of drinking water. Water scarcity is yeah. also driving the, the wastewater reuse question, of course. And I think the main driver there is a really northern part of, of the Netherlands in the Eemshaven. It's really the northeast part connected to Germany. Yeah. I think they have very limited access to tap water, but also the price of tap water is really increasing over there. Next driver has something to do with money and resources. Number two is cost saving. Everybody is thinking on uh, renewable and reusable energy because we want to be independent yeah. and that the same will happen with water. When you look at this, this is energy extraction from wastewater. Heating and cooling building with the resource wastewater. The energy in the water is there. When you look at desalination plants, how much energy this takes, of course their wastewater is probably the even better source than taking the ocean water. We have an indirect potable water reuse. This is done with an energy consumption of 1.5 kilowatt per cubic meter water. And 
finally, reuse seems to be a good image vector. Number three is to give a green image of the company. I'm really happy to see that a lot of industries are looking after the environment and hiring us to change their Waterloo. In the industrial space, it's corporate social responsibility. How companies are perceived publicly is a big thing. Many companies uh, do wastewater recycling, for example. Hotel companies who tell the clients, look, feel good. It's fantastic environment. Relax. And whenever you push the button to flush away that what's in the toilet, this is recycled water. So how can the water industry leverage this tailwind to multiply water reuse by four by 2030? As I said, we do have a special show and the special show means we today have two guests. And I would like to introduce two guests. Most of you guys will know these two gentlemen, but let's be polite. Our first guest is Vincent Cayo. He is the CEO of Water Technologies from Veolia. So welcome, Vincent. Welcome to our show. Thank you very much. Hopefully, I, I pronounced that right. It was a little bit tricky for me it's because okay it's for French. German. Is it okay? Do you want me to try to present a German guy no, with my no, French No, 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 because it's, it's my, I mean, that's a home game for me, right? The other guest we have here is Reinhard Hübner, and that's exactly the German pronunciation. And he's the CEO from Ski on Water. Hi, Reinhard. Welcome to our show. Hello. Thank you for the invitation. Glad to be here today. Great. So actually, we just seen in the video we, we had from the fair that there are two, three drivers out there in the market. The first is water scarcity. The second is um, the reduction of cost, which we can do with reuse. And the third is how we can look a bit greener and more sustainable. That's the two ways to, to look at the same coin. I'm going to start with you, Vincent, actually. We want to double check those statements. What do you think of those three drivers? Does that fit with your, your view? I fully agree that definitely scarcity is a main driver for, for reuse. I mean, it's a reality of today that 30% of the population have no access to potable water. If you add to this an increase of the population, the effect of the climate change and a global increase contamination of pollution of the available water resources, uh, the scarcity issue, the scarcity driver for reuse is just increasing every day of, of every year. So it's everybody responsibility as individuals, as municipality, but also as industrial, to be first sober, more sober about water, more reasonable, more sustainable, produce this world rather than greener, and, um, and to be more efficient. And water reuse is everything about uh, efficiency in terms of um, dealing with your water resource. You, 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 it's better for the conservation, of the underground water, of the, of the river water. And it's a good way, an affordable, an affordable way, we go back to the cost uh, issue, an affordable way to better manage the available water resources. And there is also one point that is obvious, that, but that we often forget, is that it's available, to res available resource where you need it. Wastewater is where you have population, is where you have industrial activity, so it's actually where you need water. So it makes absolute sense to have um, water reuse. That is a very good one. Uh, I'll take it, I'll put it in the fridge, because I have to, to, to submit to you something I heard while doing a tour on the IFAT. But right before, I'd like to start with you, Reinhardt. And um, I mean, Skion is, is quite a constellation. And I was wondering, when it comes to water reuse, which part of that constellation would be the most accurate to, to look at? I mean, in our core business, we build treatment plants and increasingly customers ask for recycling on the industrial side in their factory already, for example, uh, mostly for lower quality applications than the core food and beverage or whatever they do, right? Or in the semiconductor, also not for the core semiconductor. Uh, but this is happening and this is real and water scarcity is indeed one of the big drivers. Um, and we do this uh, across the board, but if we're really honest and a bit, um, yeah, I don't know, it's cynical, but water reuse is already happening and people don't know it and ignore it. Like if you drink water in London, it comes from the Thames River and all the cities upstream yes. use the water, <laughs> treated it into wastewater, discharged it into the Thames River and we abstract it again in London. And this holds for every watershed. So at the end of the day, this is an old story and we're just not good enough of it, and especially in the coastal cities where there's no downstream anymore, we, we waste it. Whereas everywhere else we already do the reuse, right? And then you see cities like Los Angeles going dry and people are afraid of the wastewater. So the question is, 
to me, not how can we deliver this from a technical point of view, but how can we change the mindset? Um, that, that's extent. an interesting thing because yesterday we had we had something really interesting because we had someone who said, well, um, water reuse, especially for, for, for drinking water, is not needed because we are here in Europe, mainland Europe, we have enough water, right? We have all the lakes. Look at Germany. Look at Switzerland. We have all the lakes. So the okay, water let's be resources. Specific. The lakes was about Switzerland. So it's okay, more okay. I, did, I, did, I didn't want to be that specific. But 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 it was pretty clear that they said, well, we we will not, we will never ever reuse the water here. And there was another interesting company which was from the north, from Scandinavia. He said, well, we are so ecological that we say it doesn't matter whether we have the water. We have to reuse that because. We have to protect our environment. So two different, two totally different opinions on the same side. How can that be? If I may, I think the second argument of your Scandinavian uh, visitor is absolutely true. I mean, we have to be sober and we have to be uh, efficient on the way we, we manage the available water resource. And the first argument actually is wrong. Because we are already not for potable water application, but typically for irrigation application. We are doing this obviously in Spain, we are doing this in Italy and in France. We are starting now the first project of wastewater reuse for potable water application because you wouldn't necessarily guess that in, a, in, a, in France. But we are the 1st of June already. 20% of the territory is officially in yeah. drought conditions uh, and and in especially in summer on the on the western part of France there are really scarce situation so we have to do so something. I extract the I extract the answer you're saying well this guy was absolutely not right I think it's changing I think it's changing yeah. I think yeah. the reality of 10 years ago let's say it was a Spanish thing 10 years ago in Europe yeah it's everybody's thing today so, Interesting. While we're on, on the drivers, you know, we, we seem to agree that we have to. And, and the first thing about have to is who's saying we have to. I mean, we have our gut feeling that might say, hey, we should. But if there's no obligation, we don't have to. It's, it's still only, okay, we are missing water, but we are not in Cape Town. See, I, I think in Cape Town, that would be a, a no-brainer. And all the places which have not experienced a net zero, they, they, don't, they don't feel really why they have to. What do you think? I think the problem is that water still is too cheap for many applications. Um, there's no real value. Water is not valued properly. You, you get, when you abstract groundwater, as an industrial user, you pay minimal amounts. Um, or we will come to that. We will water. come to that. And to a degree, sometimes that is okay, but sometimes when the water gets scarce, it's not okay. And we need to create incentives to be responsible in the use of water. And that comes typically with a price point. Um, so there must be a signal and then also recycling and closing loops will become more economical. That's one. Um, the other is water is very local and generalizations don't work. Parts of Switzerland will certainly have enough water and they are glad when they get rid of the water without flooding, right? Other parts, we have drought in Germany. The, the, the forest around Frankfurt uh, is heavily damaged from three dry years. Then there was one wetter year. Now we have a dry year again so far. Mm. And uh, there's huge debates about groundwater abstraction for drinking water for Frankfurt in the surrounding communities <laughs> because basically it's depleting groundwater reserves and that impacts the environment. We can't ignore this. There's realities even in Germany uh, where everybody says it's a wet country with lots of lakes. And we, we can't do that. I mean, we're infiltrating river water to replenish the groundwater. But we, we can't continue like that. How do people react to that? When, when you discuss water scarcity, does everybody say, of course we feel it? I'll give you a bit of background to my question. I'm podcasting now for two years, and my very first hater came the day I was talking about climate change. And since then, that guy is commenting every of my posts by saying climate change doesn't exist, uh, water scarcity is a fallacy, and all of that. And I thought we were past that point. I'm just wondering, am I the only one and I met one guy, which is really weird? Or do you also see people telling you, Come on, after all, water scarcity is just a bad year. Let's let's wait for next year. No, no. To be to be fair, no. We we, we don't see or we don't hear this anymore. I mean, you're so right. You, you, you mentioned Cape Town. Um, we've done um, water recycling and operating water recycling for potable water needs in Vinduk in Namibia. Yeah. That's a reality. They have no choice. But it was in the press 
earlier this week, um, Los Angeles uh, is having dra unprecedented droughts for the month of May and is taking unprecedented uh, restriction measures to individuals and to, to industrials. So that's the difference between the we should and the we must that you mentioned yep. a few minutes ago. They must, industrial must, because pain in water. It's I'm, just as simple as that. Yep. But, but we, we have these three drivers, right? We said that clearly water scarcity costs and the green image. So, but, but if you talk to your clients, what is one driver, or the, the major driver, why they reuse the water, why they want to reuse the water? What is, what is the answer from, from the clients? If you say, hey, if they say to you, well, Skion, Enviro, or Vivo, Vivo yeah, we want to reuse the water. What is, what, is, what is the driver for them, the major driver? It depends on the location and industry. For some, it's just pressure, public pressure. Public and, image. And sometimes, it, yeah, consumer goods companies and so on, they have to now disclose their water footprint. They have to communicate targets, right? Because the Carbon Disclosure Project is pushing it. Other um, advocacy groups are pushing some of that. So, so that is, for some, a driver where sometimes it makes no sense to do a sophisticated reuse. Because it's energy intensive, and we also have to look at the energy balance, right? You can't evaporate water just to recycle it all. Um, you have to be smarter about it. But for many customers, there's proper economic and ecological reasons. Sometimes you can recover material if you close loops on top of the water. Sometimes there is just not enough water or they just consider it's wasteful and also it's more economical to recycle water than to use fresh water. When you use city water, recycling can be very attractive financially. Actually, you offer me a very smooth transition because that energy aspect is my question in the fridge. The Berlin of Vassabet, the I'm going to pronounce it terribly, the Berlin of Vassabetrieber, um, they told me that they made a very thorough um, calculation of the energy needed once the water has done, full down the sewer, is treated in the wastewater treatment plant. Actually, it's not in the middle of the city. You have to pump it back if you want to reuse it into one of these places. And they found that the most energetically efficient way to reuse that water was to do indirect potable reuse by doing aquifer recharge. You need to have good geological conditions, but that is also something which is, which is part of the picture and which might be, correct me if I'm wrong, more difficult to grab as a technology company because you don't control the aquifer, right? I agree. I mean, it, there's not necessarily uh, an absolute measure for all the condition, but I come back to the to the local argument I gave a few minutes ago, that's very true in terms of capex, but also in terms of opex and energy savings. The fact that it's mm. there is actually a very good advantage. But what it needs, what you need to make it happen, is that you need sufficient intimacy with the business of the client, sufficient business depth, understanding, so that you enter into a system to be able to to sort out what you will recycle and what you will not recycle so that you will concentrate obviously to the low pollution large flow and you will end up with simple reuse option without the need of uh, high energy consumption so you will end up to a very efficient reuse uh, solution there was one answer we also got was the green image and green image sounds a little bit to me okay it's a kind of marketing thing Right? I'm, I'm from marketing and everybody is claiming these kind of green thing. Shouldn't we help a little bit our clients in terms of convincing them to do the right thing or to do, let's say, to use it in terms of the marketing right and telling the, the right story? Are we, t are we telling the right story to our customer or how, are we helping our customers telling the right story to the end consumer? Are we doing that? I mean, right or wrong, what's your story to what to reuse which you tell your customers? No, I mean, what you just said, it's about knowing the customer and knowing their production uh, environment, if it's an industrial customer, to figure out what makes sense for them. And in that, we tell the right story to our customers. The problem is it's so unique to every situation that when you make general comments like in this podcast now, uh, you, Let, you, you, you can't get deep enough, right? You're fully right. Let's be very concrete. Let's pick one application case and let's, let's review that use case. What we heard quite a lot was food and beverage. Would you agree that that is a right vertical to look at when it comes to water reuse? Typically, but that's, that's a good one. I mean, um, I won't give names, um, but some beverage producers have substantially reduced the, the ratio between 
the number of liters of, of soda produced and, and the number of liters of water consumed. Would it be the same wherever for us, the microphone? For, for, sorry, wherever it is for, for green image over wherever there are. I was trying to trick you, sorry. Real <laughs> in, in sustainability, I'm an optimistic guy. Huh? And, and so I believe that they are genuine in their ecological transformation. And, and it's our duty to, to accompany them on this trend. The, the reason why I'm asking the question is a little bit, I mean, we, we figured out, let's say, producing of beer, for instance. You can produce beer with completely wastewater, with treated wastewater. So we figured out that there is a company uh, which is claiming that. And there are also companies which are not claiming that. M most probably they are feared that or scared that some people will not drink their beer. Others, they use it as a kind of marketing gimmick saying, hey, we have treated wastewater and with the treated wastewater, we have produced this beer. So which one is right? You can treat any water uh, to a quality where you can make uh, food out of it. I mean, we take the water from the river, we take the groundwater, whether we take the wastewater that goes into the river and take it out of the river later again, it all does, it's all possible. Um, and it's good when people advertise that they use treated wastewater just to create awareness. But again, it's situation by situation, whether it makes sense or not. You need to look at the energy balance, you need to look at the water source and where does the water go afterwards, uh, because it may actually also be put to beneficial use where it goes when you discharge, right? Mm. When you discharge the water into a river upstream, the river also needs certain water volumes. Maybe it's not so bad. Uh, the devil is in the detail. From a technology point of view, everything is possible. We, and any customer who wants this, I mean, on the space station, they circulate the water for months. <laughs> yeah. um, and they certainly can't fly up cubic meter after cubic meter there. So sure. they drink it, they pee it, they drink it, right? I mean, that's it. And it works. Uh, and people want to go to space, right? Uh, so. <laughs> We, our obligation is to find the right answer for our customers from an economic point of view and for the environment from an environmental point of view and that is different situation by situation and we just need to be smart about it and I think many of our customers are open to this and are smart about it. Let me take my, my water question joker. Walid, I think you have a question for us. Yeah, so, so a quick question. When you look back, try to look back 10 years from now in the past, were the drivers the same or they, and they have become more intense or they have evolved. And what do you think in 10 years the drivers will be? They will be again the same? Again, if we go back to the main driver and say the main driver is this scarcity. So the same. I think we, we shouldn't emphasize too much the, the objective of being greener for some of the municipality and some industry. The real objective is business continuity, is to be able to continue to feed potable water to the individuals in the city and for an industrial to continue to run his business. There was less water scarcity or water scarcity less countries 10 years ago. So you could say it was better 10 years ago and it will be worse uh, 10 years later. So, so we need to act and we need to act now. But there's no doubt, it's a no brainer. I fully agree. And I mean, when you have this person who thinks climate change doesn't exist, <laughs> fine, um, be my guest. Uh, but you can see the increase in water scarcity. You can see the water levels in lakes. You can see the groundwater levels. This is something you can measure and scientifically prove as well. And it's easy to see. And this has increased dramatically the water scarcity over the last 10 years. And I mean, we all know it's to a large extent driven by climate change. Um, the snowpack is climate change. Um, and where the glaciers melt, there will be more water. And where there's no snow anymore, there will be less water. So this will increase further. Population growth and urbanization uh, do their part uh, on top. So it's it's actually, you, you could almost call it the perfect storm. Water will be uh, a real challenge for societies, much more so than energy, because energy you can transport, you can uh, maybe not store so well, but you can transport, and there's enough technologies out there to create energy that's environmentally friendly. There's no technology to create water. We have the water we have. There's, uh, there's nothing more. I, no. I, I think j just to double down on Walid's question, you know, it's, it's, it's not the same topic. When, when you look at, at Water for All, that was the motto in the 80s. And there was a water decade in the 80s. And at the end of the 80s, everybody was happy and still nothing had changed. And then there was Water for All in the 90s. And then there was Water for All in the 2000s. And we are in 2022. And what's our motto for 2030? Water for All. So I think what we can see with, with the question of Walid is that 10 years ago, probably the water scarcity driver was there. But maybe we looked a bit less at it. Dub down on the cost. I mean, MBRs were already mainstream 10 years ago. 
and and people and companies wanting to be green would already have existed. So it's just about you know creating that sense of urgency that 2030 is not another lost deadline. That we we do something to achieve it by 2030, and not we say in 2030, oh we tried, let's try it by 2040. Are you willing to take the risk? And many of our clients are not willing to take the risk. Why not? Because they genuinely believe because they see it that the impact of the climate change is absolutely real and it's much faster than, than they thought so they're changing and again um, it's difficult to to assess which ones just want to be green and which ones are, are genuine in, in their transformation but let's be pragmatic they will all transform that, that's my bet they will all transform and we need to I mean, as specialists, as technologists, we need to encourage them, we need to help them, and we need to accompany them the best we can. I have many follow-up questions to that, but we have a, a, a section on the challenges, and I think the follow-up question will fit quite nicely there. So I propose you to switch to the challenges ahead. So we look in the future and we look what do we have to overcome now that we agree that those three drivers exist. Right, Bjorn? Yep. I mean, we have all the technologies, we have the drivers, but the key question is really, why does our client does not reuse 100%? What is the reason for that? We ask the question again to some clients here. And here are the challenges. Now, there are also several challenges we will have to take up as an industry. Number one, uh, I think, is, the, is given by the local regulation. It depending on the country. Let's say if you go to country, com countries like uh, France or Italy or Spain, Reducing the wastewater in the food and beverage industry, it's very, very complicated. Eh? For me, it's legislation, actually. The laws forbid us to do what really is the best way to do. We need a change of law. Maybe if there is a clear regulation, that will change. They have released the new norms in Europe. If you read them carefully, it's all about municipal wastewater. True. And when they speak about industrial, they say, OK, you can take it to the point that later, you can throw it to the municipal wastewater treatment plant and from there you can reuse them. And this is insane. So you should be able to reuse it in your own site. One of the most interested in the water we use is the food and beverage industry, but also other industries where, especially where the local regulation are driving these requests. Legislation has changed, okay. but also the need to do something has changed because we see the extreme drought and extreme rainfall periods, climate change, uh, but also the opinion of the, the consumers. Everyone we asked agreed on the last point. We need to take everyone on board. How? Well, that's the challenge. There are parts in the world people have bigger problems. The main thing for municipal and in particular direct potable reuse is the public perception, but also the cost. You must put pressure on the people that they do something. Could be negative pressure or positive pressure. We have a very intensive communication platform. We also invite people to come to our water plants or wastewater plants, or we have tours. And we also communicate with the pupils. I feel like the general public who aren't involved in the water space are probably a little bit naive to the fact that there are water pressures. It's definitely going into the into the mainstream media. Personally, I've seen it in the UK, but I think that if we were able to push more public perception of how valuable a, a, a resource water was, then maybe the public perception of, to some degree, reusing water, whether that be direct or indirect potable, various other means of using it, I think that would really sort of relieve that pressure on water companies for their worries around that sort of topic. So, Vincent, Reinhardt, and all our experts in the public and in the chat, how do you think we can win the public's hurt to water reuse? So actually, we see that we have two main challenges ahead, which is the regulation and the public's perception. Do you want to start or do I take my example of the regulation? No, let, let, me, let me take my example first, because we saw it also in the chat. Reinhardt, we both have a combination. You don't know so far, but we both worked on the same project. You won, unfortunately, at this time, which was Tesla. And I would like to talk 
a minute about Tesla because there was also a question in the chat about Tesla. We all know that Tesla built their gig fab in an area where we have a lot of water issues with, with the groundwater, right? The question here is why are they reusing their wastewater just it's just a small portion? Why are they not going to reuse the entire wastewater, especially if they are in an area where they have these issues with the groundwater because they need groundwater for 30,000 people. That you can do this for automotive. I mean, Audi has proven that because they have a completely, you know, wastewater free facility in Mexico, right? So the question is here, why is a customer like Tesla, for instance, coming to us and saying, hey, I need a wastewater treatment plant, but the reuse, well, 20, 30%, maybe in future, we have a long-term plan we will have 100%, but right now, just 2030. Why is that? How can that be happen? To be very honest, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not involved in detailed project work. Uh, we are 3,200 people and 900 million euros turnover. If I w am involved in every project, I will, like, my head will explode. Um, I would assume that they really looked at this uh, in quite some detail because of the public uh, communication on this in the media and in the local community uh, and that there's a good reason um, but I honestly can't answer I, 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 um, can, I can name many many other industries but, I, ju I just took but, that um, example yeah but again the question is from a system point of view what is the right thing I can't answer this for this situation there is an energy ticket to reuse in certain cases and the question also is what happens to the water afterwards does it go somewhere where it's put to beneficial use um, in a different way, in nature again, or something like that, right? But um, so it's it's very difficult without knowing all the details to say. What I can say is, from a technology point of view, you can do all kinds of things. But if we go to the extreme at the end, for example, of evaporation, uh, for system depends on the on the size you spend between fifteen and one hundred twenty kilowatt hours per cubic meter of water. Desalination seawater is three and a half kilowatt hours. So when you are at the coast, the question at some point is, uh, do you evaporate your stream just to make it disappear uh, or do you desalinate seawater? What's better for the environment? It's, it's not always a straightforward answer. I mean, Tesla is just one example. I mean, we all know that we have tons of customers with they reuse the water, but they don't reuse for 100 percent. I mean, we are the expert here, right here at EFAT. Here's the industry. We know how it works. We know that the technologies are given. Shouldn't we? tell our clients, well, you want a wastewater treatment plant, but please, reuse must be 100%. Shouldn't we do that? No, we shouldn't. I think, again, it's when Raynor mentioned that we shouldn't look at water only, and we, we, sh we must look at the overall environmental footprint of our plant, and in particular, their energy, and then their CO2 footprint. And without knowing the specifics of the, of the project you mentioned, 20-30% seems very low, but it can make a lot of sense to reuse 80% of the water and not spending the additional very costly, from an energe energetic point of view, remaining 20%. So, and so still you recycle 80%, which is already a very sizable um, step compared with the situation where you recycle nothing. The, 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 the majority of the answers, I will give it directly to you, because the majority of the answers was the issue we have is regulation. So all companies we talked to, the conclusion was we need stricter regulation that our clients, or name any, any client, will purchase a wastewater treatment plant with 100% reuse or a, even more reuse percentage. That was the conclusion. When it comes to regulation, I would say what we've seen is that, that there's one good pupil, there's one bad pupil, and there's one in between. The, the good pupil, surprisingly, is China. I mean... I say surprisingly because they have that image sometimes to be not that environmentally friendly, but when it comes to be very rational, they said at some places we don't have enough water, so you have to reuse or you have to close the factories, and that is efficient. But I mean, regulation, I'm, I'm against regulating 100% use. I'm totally against it because it could lead to completely wrong outcomes, right? So the question is, everybody needs a permit for the freshwater use and needs to get the freshwater somewhere. In that permitting process, you can include a reuse target based on whatever that customer does. And in certain industries, it's easier to do more reuse. In other industries, it's less easy. 
so so the government can do all that and typically the permitting also happens with something in mind in terms of how much water they get and how much water they're allowed to use and when you look at the semiconductor industry for example they go to very dry places there's a lot of debate and a lot of uh, uh, attempts to minimize water usage in, in that industry there are also again there's a permitting issue and then you don't need a mandate for reuse and you can also solve it via the price point. If you if you get water for free, fresh ground, if you can use groundwater for free, that's wrong. That was my bad pupil, actually. The bad pupil for me would be uh, California. California has taken the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, which is a regulation which is putting a price on groundwater or, or incitating people to put a price on groundwater, but it's going to be enforced in 2040. So it's like, you can continue to take groundwater for free, but if you will, we can start today and put some... And I think there's only... Um, uh, what's the name of this festival? The, the very fancy festival with all the... Oh, I lost the name. Which one? The, the, this festival where all the stars are going. Um, the Coachella. Uh, Coachella. The district of Coachella in, in California is the only one <laughs> where they put some price on the water, on the groundwater. And surprise, surprise, that was a way to finance a scheme where they reuse water and they inject it in, in, in the groundwater. So it's about... Yeah. It's a difference. Uh, I agree again, with you. Difference as long as California that, grows rice... Do we need to talk about reuse? Okay. Or do we? I mean, this, I'm, I'm cynical now, but this is a very complex setup with the water rights, and this is, in my view, and from a European perspective, this water rights thing is crazy. Okay, then I take it to the example directly from Europe. We have a joker before. Uh, let, sorry let me, to interrupt. Uh, give me, give me that second because we have to close the loop here. We have even Europe. We have maybe we are not in California. We don't have it for free. But even here in, in Germany, northern Germany, we have big food and beverage companies, right? And they get water, fresh water for less than 20 cents a cubic meter. Not giving so, any names, but they would be the same color than Veolia? <laughs> the, que the question is, with that price, how you want to force him that he reuse the water? Because there is, there is no, from, from the cost perspective, from the economical side, there's no reason why they should just, reuse just, the water. Just shouldn't we, shouldn't we start there? The legislator could, but <coughs> remember that the should and the must. Exactly. Maybe he has no choice because he will have no water. So we will have to reuse no, anyway. But, 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 let's, but let's say, I mean, why are, why are we selling just for less than 20 cents? I mean, we could send it for two euros. So maybe then he's more thinking about water, wastewater reuse to, you know, to dilute their fresh water for whatever reasons. That is, that is the, 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 uh, the It's a the valid question. argument and the regulation and the normal in Europe. In Europe, I think it's important it, to read Precise in Europe yeah. are, are not pushing for reuse at the moment, but they will change. They're oriented towards reuse for irrigation only, probably because that's what we needed so far. But it's, it's changing. Regulation in Singapore, regulation in Namibia again. I love Namibia, so I quote Namibia <laughs> always are different. Okay. okay. So I take the question on this topic coming from. Uh, Ravid Levy. So it's a concept he calls edible reuse. So basically, he's saying, why don't we focus double down on agricultural reuse, like taking the water, which is less costly to treat and less uh, costly, and use it for agriculture, since anyway, agriculture uses the majority of the water. I'll just follow up on this question again. So it gives you a bit of time to, to think of an answer, because that was my, my, my pupil, which is in between, because that's Europe, taking that regulation and reuse, which is really catered towards agriculture. So maybe that's the name of the game. Rabbit is right. 70% of the water goes to agriculture. Maybe we shall start by looking there. Edible reuse. I like it. <laughs> no, but And if you're really smart about it, at least as long as we use it in the right parts of the year for irrigation, we stop the nutrient removal. And we use it mm. as fertilizer as well. Mm. Water fit um, for purpose. Because then mm. you can directly recycle the nutrients. Uh, you can't do this all the time because you also don't want to pollute the groundwater with nutrients, obviously. But in the growing uh, cycle, there's phases where we could maybe then stop the nutrient removal in the wastewater. And of course, agricultural reuse makes sense. And also, that can be designed uh, in a watershed in a way where it can go downhill, right? And not uphill. So you don't have to pump it back. You use it further downstream. I watched it from remote, but isn't that a bit of the story you have in Vendée? Sorry, I, I, I couldn't... The, 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 your reference in Vendée, isn't that a bit of that story of reusing cleverly? The reference in Vendée uh, is very much about reusing wastewater for potable water needs. It's potable, it's, sorry, my bad. Yeah, it's potable water needs. And it's 
we treat wastewater with technology, with pretty advanced technology because we use our barrel on, on, on these plants and we re-inject it to the environment just upstream the potable water reservoir. But it's, it's reused for potable water needs and it's pretty unique uh, in, in Europe. And, and we hope uh, and we believe that this will be a, a one of the drivers pushing or changing the regulation. So regulation, if I get you right, to try to summarize it, shouldn't be a must, but a strong nudge, like playing on the, on the incentives might be the price, might be releasing. Because I think if you would like to do what you say today, which is to, to cater the water just to what you need for agriculture, it would not be allowed everywhere. You would have to, to test that water quite extensively before being allowed to, 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 to water your, your crops with it. Regulation plays a role in all of this. We also have this on the biosolid side, which is another recycling stream. Um, and we're not going into that now, but um, the regulation needs to be tailored to more recycling, clearly. And that is something that should be also hopefully identical across all of the EU, uh, so that you don't have a different uh, set of rules in every country. And I mean, uh, in the US, they are ahead of us in, in that respect. California did proper uh, reuse regulations already. What, what do you, but, okay, <laughs> but let's say, I mean, we have two flagships here, right, for the water industry. What do you, I mean, I was going to ask exactly that question. It's a mind connection. <laughs> I mean, the only, the only, let's say, companies or industries who can change that or can, who can go to somewhere to get a new regulation or to, you know, to get a change in the regulation should be the companies which are here at IFAD, right? So it should be us. So because the argument yesterday I heard, we should go all together, we should march to Brussels and would, should do something, you know, a few demonstrate years, and say march for, to Washington. For, 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 better, for better regulations. So in terms of, last time in terms of Peoria, <laughs> what, what, what are you doing to, to influence a little bit the regulation? Is there anything you do? Be careful because you have two French around these tables. So we're pretty good at demonstrating I know. riots and marching. And so <laughs> the, op the opposite are the Germans. <laughs> I'm not sure uh, that's the only way. I'm not sure that's the most efficient way. I think one thing we need to keep in mind when we talk about regulation, we also need to talk about risk, and then we need to talk about trust and transparency. I mean, there's I mean, those obstacles you mentioned. There was a regulation and there also the, the, the cultural perception of what mm -hmm. water is and also probably worsened by some very crazy and uh, mista marketing mistakes such as from... Uh, from toilet to tap and, and, and things like that. I think to, to allow the regulation change, we, and we being the people in, in, uh, in IFAT, we need to give to our clients, we need to give the regulator the sufficient level of transparency in terms of monitoring, in mm. terms of water quality, so that there is enough trust between us and our clients and the regulators and then all individuals to make it happen. Well, but would you agree that we are the only industry or the only companies who can influence a little bit the politicians? I mean, our, our clients will not go there, right? They will not say, hey, we need stricter because I would like to spend more money on the wastewater reuse side. But again, unless they need to do water reuse to continue their business. And that will be the case for several industrial and that will be the case for several municipalities. They will have no choice. So I think it's more for us to give them the means, the mm -hmm. technologies, and then the confidence and all the tools around it to make sure everybody is confident that it's done safely on a sustainable way and so on. Okay. But we're not the only one to, to, to have to influence as regulators. So, Reinhard, you will not march to Brussels? <laughs> no, I will not <laughs> march to Brussels. Um, lobbying is something that we, we're, we're, number one, we're still too small for that. Number two, it's, it's not, we, we're not in the political game, uh, we're in the technology game. But I fully agree, we can equip our customers with what they need to make it happen. And we can, when uh, politicians need the technical advice, we can provide the technical advice. And we can help also with digitalization, for example, to make it safe. Because by now we have the solutions to remote monitor and control permanently to, uh, in, act immediately if there is a quality issue. This, these technologies weren't around 20 years ago and 10 years ago. So by now, 
it is also possible to decentralize and recycle closer to the source. Um, the trend for centralization was better quality of the operations because you couldn't remote monitor, you couldn't remote control, all this is possible now. So we can provide also the means to demonstrate it safe as an industry. And, and again, there's enough places where this is done already and where everybody is jolly happy with the outcome of what we deliver. Okay. Talking of this, this confidence element, which is what you said with the, the new technologies, which is what you said with we have to prove how we would work it and how we would help our customers to, 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 to live with that. If you look at what IFAT has done, there was, there's this DWA booth at the entrance of IFAT and they have like tours of the IFAT. And the very first tour they had was about water reuse. And that was the case Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. So it sounds like something they want to promote. Yet, that was the second challenge ahead, is how do we tell better stories and how do we convince the people? And I, I took that tour and that tour was giving a hell of good information, but was also say, saying, we did a pilot there, it worked fine. We did a pilot there, it worked fine. We did a pilot there, it worked fine. And that is not reassuring me. That is telling me we are still at the stage where we want to pilot everything. So isn't that a place for companies like yours at some point to be bold and to say, you want to pilot, guess what? I'm not piloting unless you have like, like I'll, um, utilities you're making in the US, I pilot and you take a strong commitment. That if I reach that with my pilot, then you go full scale. That's very interesting. You mentioned piloting. I'm back to the Jordan project in France, which is a pilot, a pilot for Vendée, so that particular region in France and a pilot for France in general. What we are hearing now from several municipalities that we probably won't wait the, the end of the, of the piloting before we go full scale because there's enough trust and confidence on the technology and the application. And again, the need is there and, and, and the urgency is there. But if, let's say if the need is here, we have all the technologies, we have the drivers, what is needed to increase, what was the number, five times? Yeah, multiplied by five times. Five times, we need five times more. You, you know the water industry. If you want to multiply by five by 2030, the tenders need to be out now because it needs to be prepared, tendered, um, then someone has the general contractor, then you tender the subcontracts and all of that, then you build, then you commission. It's not gonna happen in a snap. So what, what, what do we need? Hey. But again, I, I try to go out of Europe. It, it's happening. I mean, we've, we've delivered or we've delivered last year and we're delivering a second one on two very large wastewater recycling plants in Egypt for irrigation, but recycling plants. It, it's, it's happening in, in many places. I mean, it's, it, and, and regarding I think we cannot argue that it's just something for the future. It's happening now. And what are the stories we have to tell today to, to convince the people, to get the general opinion, to be happy about the fact that when I pee, it's 90% of the nitrogen going to the wastewater. It would make quite a lot of sense to take that and to turn it as, as a way to grow my crops. I think we, we, the awareness part we need to do and our cust I mean, w w the customers are buying already. We even did a recycling uh, technology solution for a pharma packaging company, where regulations-wise it's actually not so straightforward, uh, but there were enough applications in the factory where the water had to be high quality, but not uh, falling under regulations that didn't allow reuse. It's all possible. Um, and maybe what Singapore does with the new water in bottles is one thing to convince people, right? I have on my desk in the office, I have these new water bottles and I offer my guests this recycled water. Of mm -hmm. course, I don't truck water from Singapore. I just put normal tap water in there, but it says recycled effluent, right? <laughs> now the mystery is gone. <laughs> no, but, but people have this perception. And again, I mean, maybe you get the Germans with beer, maybe you get other countries with other drinks or something. We need to create a story of, of uh, living the example, right? Uh, publicly. Uh, advocating this and I'm, I'm happy to drink any recycled wastewater there is. Uh, it's very high quality and um, this awareness can be created and again Singapore has been good about this. In reality most of their new water is put into industrial use and not into portable use but they also have amazing schemes to increase the water efficiency of industrial customers with subsidies and support and technical advice and so on because they have no water and if the pipeline from Malaysia is shut off they really have no water. What you say is very important this 
um, bring some some support and 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 help the industrials. Industrials don't have to be water professionals. That's why we have. We are here as a water industry, so we have to be supportive and understand and take them where they are on that journey. Um, how, how do you put that into music? To, or even broader, do you put that into music? Is it something you see as, as your role to, to guide them, to take them by the hand and to say, look, maybe you could do that? We, we completely see it as our role to together with them enter into their business and to understand what makes sense from a global environmental point of view in terms of reuse. We take this stream, we don't take that stream. And, and to stop this bad habit that we had in the past of uh, just mixing all the streams in a big nasty soup and try to, 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 to treat all of it. We stop that, we go with them, we start with audits, it's kind of complete package. We try to understand their specifics, the specifics of the stream, and really try to propose them the best deal uh, in terms of, uh, term of reuse. Let me jump in because, I mean, I, I can't leave them go without having this, this question because this is an idea which came up, I don't know, some months ago and we always discussed about that. We have these kind of CO2 certificates, right? We know all that. What about a kind of wastewater certificate for the industry? What is, I mean, was the same to, to force them to reuse more or to save water and then they can sell it. This kind of this robust business model. What, 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 would that help to, to achieve the goals? Okay. The problem is that water is so local that um, you, can, you can only trade this locally in the same watershed. Uh, and that makes it, I think, very impractical. So I'm not convinced. But isn't uh, that the same with the CO2? No. CO2 you can trade globally, right? Because if you save a ton of CO2 here or in France or in Italy or in Australia, it doesn't make a difference to the environment. But water is so local, um, it's a maximum watershed. Um, I also, I'm, I'm not so, so negative on customers not wanting this, in particular industrial customers. We have customers that pay us to do a water footprint assessment of their factory and come up with ideas to increase the water efficiency. And that includes using water more efficiently. That's the best to save mm -hmm. water in the first place, followed by recycling, followed by, and it's again what you said, stream by stream um, and segment by segment in a factory. So there's, there's customers who are doing that. And when you do a project for a customer that needs a new plant, of course, you try to find the most economical solution for that customer. And if reuse is an economical or ecologically attractive solution for the customer, you offer this also to differentiate from competition. Because that's where maybe we, with the experience we have, can also offer something that some smaller competitors can't offer because they don't have the experience with that. So okay, then, then, then the, if you don't like it, okay, I get it. But what, it, what about incentivize, incentivize the industry that they have some kind of tax benefits? Yes, yeah, sorry, you was very rude to me this morning. This is, you know, now I give it you back. No. Well, what about incentivizing the industry? Let's say if they go to that level that they have some tax benefits, for instance. So, but I think we because we need to we, we need to we need to five times we have to five times more wastewater treatment or water reuse as we have right now because we need to do something absolutely and, and maybe and maybe that's because we we do the business that we do that we are more optimistic uh, than you are but you know we talk about clients as a kind of uh, strange and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and a virtual thing, but clients are made of individuals. Yep. And the individuals who are running companies today, who are managing cities today, are not the same as the one we had 20 years ago. And not the same precisely on their genuine will to do something positive about the environment. So I think we, many of them are genuinely convinced that they want to move without talking about changing the regulation, economical incentive and so on, they really want to do something, many of them. And, okay. and it could be even more the case in 10 okay. years because again, the, the individuals who will be our clients in 10 years. Okay, then let's have an agreement. 10 years from now, we will meet here again, IFAD 2032, and we will discuss about that, okay? Agreed? Great, yeah, 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 great. Totally. <laughs> let's go very, 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 very fast. Um, Walid, you have 30 my, seconds. My question based on our, all our discussion, are you optimistic? <laughs> yes, definitely. Okay, we have this discussion. Yeah, so totally. I mean, okay, that's good. I mean, coming from some of the CEOs of leading companies in the water industry, I think it's, it's, it's really reassuring. a very good point. Yeah. We are optimistic. I mean, we, 
we very much at the place when we can influence, we can do something. And, and it's, it's down to us, it's down to the individuals again in our companies to act and to do something now. And I have to say, I mean, I'm in water since 2006. And I have seen a change over the last three, four years at a pace that is much faster than before uh, because the attitude has changed. It's younger leaders, the employees demanding of their employer to be uh, environmentally responsible. There's public pressure, but there's also really the conclusion that we have no alternative yeah. and people are getting this. Uh, but we have to also keep in mind when we build something in industrial, it has to last 20, 30 years. In municipal, it has to last 100 years mm -hmm. uh, because that's the reinvestment cycle. Um, you can't expect magic overnight. And I, I see fundamental change in attitude uh, on the user side. And, and that makes me very optimistic. Excellent. Actually, Vincent, Reinhard, I'm a bit frustrated because I had so many follow-up questions, but your two answers make so much of a perfect conclusion that I cannot just reopen a segment. And I think we are at the end of that live. It was a blast to discuss all of that. We've been back and forth. That guy has spoken all the time. But nevertheless, <laughs> I think we had some very insightful um, information that you yeah. shared about your vision of the market. And it's very interesting to see that the conclusion is positive yeah. to a story which is often a story of doom and gloom. So, so really, thank you for that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, just, thank you very much. Bisson. You have some closing thoughts? Uh, just just thank you. I mean, it was great having you here and you delivered a great value for the water industry. It was not for us. I mean, we had so many viewers and questions on the chat. We couldn't answer all of them. Sorry, guys. Um, but it was great having you here. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, uh, thanks a lot. And since we don't march to Brussels, we happily invite anybody from Brussels who wants to see something live uh, <laughs> to come to one of the plants we built and we'll show them how it works. <laughs> That's a great conclusion. Thanks a lot. That Brian. was a perfect plug. <laughs> Any final words? See you next time. See you next time. Bye-bye.